I've worked in manual labor my entire life, but I took a gig hauling trucks for a few years in the early 2000s. I got offered a package that I couldn't refuse in the way of full-time pay with part-time hours if I can meet the arrival times. I got insurance, benefits, everything an employee dreams about. I got my CDL as well as a few other certifications and found myself on the road just a month or so later. I had a lot of jobs where things got weird or just crazy, but one particular evening makes the others pale in comparison. I don't like stories with a lot of fluff, so I'm just going to jump right into it. I was on a return trip from Oregon to Minnesota. I had already made one delivery, hooked up a second, and was now technically on my way home. This was about the halfway point. Weather is great. I'm feeling good, motivated. My time on that trip was well ahead of schedule, so I made sure not to push it or burn myself out. I found it super defeating to get home from a long haul, to be too exhausted to enjoy it. It's always better to take a little time and stay level. I also have a bit of a heart condition, so heavy caffeine intake isn't an option for me. Most of my life has been all natural, using whatever remedy that I could come up with to keep my energy up. The biggest influence was just a good diet, exercise, and consistent sleep schedule. That means I stopped every night, generally at the same time, got a good amount of rest, and that's it. Many of my trips were clocked to the very last second, but I managed to always arrive on time. I passed over the Idaho border and started gunning through Montana. Lots of beauty, but ultimately not much in the way of civilization out there. The route took me through Missoula, Butte, and some more established townships. Between them though, you'd be lucky to find a service station of any kind. Rural stretches like this always kept me on my toes as I'd heard horror stories about guys running out of gas, blowing tires, or encountering engine trouble. There isn't help for 75 miles in each direction. On top of that, some of these rural stretches don't see a lot of traffic. Some early mornings, I wouldn't see another car on the road for an hour at a time. I had my eyes set on a trucking station out in the middle of nowhere, between Bozeman and Livingston. I'd roll through Bozeman around dinner time, grab a quick bite to eat, then push on towards the station, let my food settle and digest a bit. After an hour of driving, I'd hit my target, pull over and totally be ready for bed. I liked routine, I liked structure, I liked having a plan. That night, everything was supposed to be simple. At first, it was. My plan was going smoothly. I got dinner, gassed up, experienced little to no traffic, was back on the road in no time. Soon, I found my head swimming from the digestion and long day of driving, but there it was. Some lights out there alongside of the highway. You know exactly what I'm talking about. These big concrete pullouts on the side of interstates every hundred miles or so. They usually have a bathroom, vending machine, trash cans, everything people living on the road might need. I pulled in and found a rare sight. Not a single vehicle anywhere. No one was using this rest station and I liked that. There was a kind of security in being solo, if that makes sense. I let the truck cool down, locked everything up, then crawled into the living space in the back. My area was very simple. A bed, small table attached to the wall, and an overhead shelf thing to store most of my belongings. I also had a little makeshift power cell, which I used to charge a portable flip DVD player that had both disc player and a screen. It was one of those inventions of the 2000s that could have only been popular then. I settled in with my big blankets and pillows and watched one of my favorites, Resident Evil or Reign of Fire, an action thriller of some kind. Despite the shooting and explosions, I fell asleep just after 30 minutes. I closed the DVD player and surrendered to the darkness inside my cab. It must have only been a couple hours later and something woke me up. I couldn't place it, but I knew something jarred me. I have a habit of snoring occasionally and when I do, I sometimes wake myself up with one of those louder rips. I thought maybe that's what happened, so I snuggled in for a few more hours of sleep. I like to hit the road before sunrise, 
get those extra miles in before the rest of the world wakes up. Just as I closed my eyes though, I heard it, the sound that woke me up. It wasn't a snore like I thought, but the abruptness of a cough. It came from somewhere beyond the cab, outside in the parking lot. It sounded partially muffled. Maybe another trucker had pulled in, and I just simply hadn't heard the rumble. It really didn't seem that likely, but I guess anything is possible, right? I wanted to be sure of what I heard, so I turned on the small overhead light. The second that flicked on, I could hear shoes slapping the asphalt and the sound of someone running away. As I listened, the footsteps faded a bit. The person was running away from my truck. They must have seen the light come on and reacted to that. But at this point, I'm now on high alert. I turn the light off so as not to give away my position within the truck. As long as it's dark, it's almost impossible to see in the depth of the sleeping cab. So I used that to my advantage. Looking out, I surveyed the parking lot and found something unusual. An older van parked across the lot, sitting angled so the broadside faced my windshield. Definitely weird, as I was 100% alone when I pulled in originally. That parking lot was empty. I tried to be reasonable though. Maybe he was walking his dog, having a smoke. Whatever the case, the person was likely a long haul traveler just like myself. The guy was probably stretching his legs, doing a few laps of the parking lot when he accidentally woke me up. Once he saw the light, he realized that he made a mistake, then hightailed it back to his van. It really wasn't the most out of the ordinary thing to happen at a truck stop. With a little apprehension, I let everything go and I didn't investigate it any further. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't fall back asleep. Just as I started to drift off, I heard those footsteps again. And then what I thought sounded like someone tugging on the passenger side door handle. There was an unmistakable click, then the sway of someone stepping off the sidebar. Whoever I'd heard coughing just tried to get inside my truck. At this point, all my alarms are going off in my head, and that structured, well-planned part of my brain is now scrambling. For whatever reason, and a lot of my friends have given me flack for it over the years, but I didn't carry a gun on these truck hauls. I did have a short club that I used to check my tire pressure, and that was a great second option. At this point, I believe my best choice was to nut up and confront whoever was milling around the parking lot. Let them know that my truck wasn't public property. All at once, I throw the passenger door open, click my flashlight on. I had a small steady stream light that could reach something like 30 yards. And not with that puffy yellow flare of a cheap flashlight, but white concentrated light. I swept it back and forth. I saw nothing. So I started inspecting the truck and the trailer. I saw nothing at first glance, so I hopped down and did a full lap of the rig. Still nothing, not even underneath it. Only one option left now, time to go look at that van. I swept the flashlight around and started marching up to the rear. I wanted to see the license plate before I checked it out any further. As I go to eye the back of the bumper, I brought my light up so I could see. My eyes naturally went to the license plate, which was from South Dakota but something else caught my attention. I couldn't place it at first, but as I kept looking, it all came into focus. Below the back of the van, near the far back tire, there was a pair of boots. Someone was crouched and hiding on the other side of it. Only the toe tips poked out, but it was enough for me to see what was going on. I left the light on the boots for 10, 20 seconds, long enough for them to realize that they were exposed. I watched in disbelief as the boots slowly shuffled backward until they were completely hidden behind the tire. My stomach soured at the whole thing. This person clearly had ill intentions and I wanted nothing to do with them. I wanted to say something but I found myself completely speechless. I'm not confrontational. You may have gleaned that from my lack of a firearm. I didn't want to issue a threat to someone who might have the upper hand. I just backed up until I reached my truck, hopped in, and locked the door. I figured that encounter was enough. I got out and found them, who would come up and keep messing with me. 
We both knew what was going on at this point, so the mystery was completely over. Just some vagrant weirdo looking to make a score. Now that he knew the truck wasn't abandoned, I hoped that he would just move on. I sat for 45 minutes, and that van never moved. I didn't see anything move. No person, no door opening or closing. It's like they were still hiding behind that rear passenger tire. As the morning went on though, sleep came and kissed me and I knew I needed to get at least a couple of more hours of rest if I wanted to have a successful day. My eyes started to droop and soon I was snoozing. The sound that woke me this time was clear, loud and right outside the door. It was the sound of a man clearing his throat, the sound someone makes when they want your attention. My eyes shot up and moved to the glass, and there, just peeking over the lip of the door, I can see someone looking into my cab. I freeze, hoping they can't see me, but it doesn't matter. This guy's eyes are rolling back and forth, taking it all in, looking for whoever is inside. He looks crazy, like he'd given himself a haircut with a butter knife. Some of it was shaved, some of it was long, and I could see nicks along his scalp. I think his eyebrows were shaved off too, but it was hard to tell in the moonlight. I could literally feel this guy pulling on the door handle, making the entire truck move. I did the only thing that I could think of, shout as loud as I could. What do you want? I hollered at the glass, still motionless in the back of the cab. This is also a censored conversation, as I remember swearing in literally every sentence that I spoke to this guy. He said, it's me. Who? I asked. Okay, maybe this was a case of a mix-up. I sat up and reached for the club on the floor. It's Jake, come on, he pleaded. I don't know you. I'm not from here. Now please just get away from my truck, I explained to him. The conversation devolved from that point forward. Playing hard to get, I like it. Let's do something different, he said. This guy went on at length about what he wanted to do to me, and none of it involved violence at all. Everything this guy said was sexual from start to finish. I'm watching this guy lick the window of my semi-truck as he tells me he wants to kiss my feet, worship me, pleasure every part of me. I'm not homophobic, but the whole thing was nauseating. As he's going on and on and on about his sexual fantasies, transitioning into what he wants me to do to him. And I'm yelling for him to just please go away throughout the entire thing. His tone changes. He starts talking about his desires, which were much more violent. This guy wanted someone to hurt him during their sexual escapades, punched, choked, tied up and abused, the whole shebang. I couldn't really believe what I was hearing. He switched from licking the window to tapping on it before finally smashing his fist into the glass. I had to do something. I remembered my portable DVD player and for whatever reason, came up with this weird little plan. I opened up and faced it away from the front of the cab so the light would illuminate my face, but he wouldn't be able to see what the light was coming from. I'm calling the police, I said, hoping the light source would look like a car phone or a radio. I've got your South Dakota plates too. Richard, he asked. I'm not who you're looking for, now get the hell out of here, man, was the last thing that I ever said to this person. I watched him leap down and start running all in one swift motion. The van fired up and without even turning its headlights on, fled from the parking lot like a bat out of hell. Honestly, I ended up doing the same. After another inspection of the trailer and tires, I made sure everything was secure. I rolled out and made for Livingston that morning really played with the idea of calling the police and making some kind of report, but thought it would be more trouble than it's actually worth. I didn't have the actual plate number, just that it was a Dakota van, so I figured my report would go absolutely nowhere. It wasn't until I got out of trucking that I realized how common this type of encounter was, especially after the invention of Craigslist. Truck stops have always been known for midnight rendezvous, but became explicit for random hookups all over the country particularly for traveling men who wanted to experiment. Whoever that Jake guy was, he thought I was Richard, who was probably another trucker rolling through Montana that night. 
Jake must have gotten the truck station mixed up or Richard was late to the arrival, so got us confused. Regardless and whatever the case, I'm very glad that I had my doors locked that night, as I could be telling a very different story right now. I have a plan when you hit the road, and always stick to that plan. When I was much younger, I would drive a big rig throughout the summer to make some extra money. My real job was school, so summertime was the perfect time to get behind the wheel and see some of the country. Getting paid to roll across state lines, yeah, it sounded like a dream. And honestly, and I'd had fantasies about being a truck hauler in my youth, but my parents pushed me to go to college and do something else. Either way, I got to satisfy my desire and drive every summer. It turned out to be such a cool gig that my wife would come with me as well, which isn't uncommon. She actually got her CDL, so she could just drive the truck in the event that something happened to me. It was a great little thing that we had going. It was some of the most fun that we've ever had. There's something beautiful about waking up to the unpredictable life on the road. There was only one of these drives that had us second guessing the job. Honestly, it was the scariest thing that ever happened to us, both on and off the road. Nothing compares to the night that we had outside of Tucson. It had been routine the entire drive. We brought the load down from Idaho and now we're headed back with a different trailer in tow. We're making good time, but a little complication had us leaving Tucson a little later than we wanted to. It was dark. We only made it about an hour outside the city. There was a truck stop ahead. We were both honestly pretty tired. It seemed early to pull over, but we wanted to start our return trip totally fresh. We pulled into the truck stop, found that it was wall to wall with semis and smaller trucks too. Every single stall was filled. Even the lane space was crowded with people parked illegally. It was crazy to see, like they were weathering a storm or something. We did a U-turn through the lot and jumped back out on the highway, hoping that there would be a pullout large enough to accommodate us somewhere ahead. Fortunately, we were in luck because there was a big dusty stretch just off the highway. A nice wide dirt road took us off the highway about 100 feet, then proceeded to open up into a field of some kind. I assumed it was an outdoor recreation area. This is where people unloaded their dirt bikes and quads. My wife said that once the sun was up, we'd probably see jumps everywhere, maybe even a dust bowl to rip through. The only thing we could see in the moment was a tree stand off in the distance. Acacia and mesquite grow in little pockets throughout the desert, so we figured there was a wash that cut through where the trees grow, something to keep them watered. We immediately got into our usual routine checked the load and made sure everything was secure, put a couple of cones behind the trailer just in case someone came ripping through. Then I looked at the tires for lumps, punctures, anything. While I did this, my wife filled out the mileage logs, another light paperwork that comes with the job. We made short work of the chores at hand. After that, it was time to veg out. We had a light dinner, played a card game, then snuggled up to catch some shut-eye. We didn't even put a movie on or anything. They usually just kept us both awake, so we just slipped away into the darkness of the cab, as it was quiet, still, and just a perfect night. I remember how serene it was as we fell asleep, because when we woke later, it was the exact opposite. The thing that woke me first was my wife. She was shaking me, hollering that something was wrong. I sat up and looked around, but I couldn't really see anything. We used a divider to separate the cab from the sleeping bunk in the back. Regardless, I could now hear what she was talking about. I could feel it. Something was lightly making the truck rock back and forth. Now I know what you're thinking. The truck and the trailer weigh tons upon tons, and you're right. It takes a lot to make a big rig shake, but it isn't impossible. A good wind can push the cab around, make the trailer wiggle around like a big metal worm. A pothole will make the whole thing bounce. Honestly, if someone is climbing up the side or back ladder, or just messing with the trailer hatch, you can feel it inside the truck. It's subtle, but it's there. Now, if someone were to climb up the side step of the truck itself, or climb up in the back where the hitch is, you could feel every single step. This, however, didn't feel like any of that. It kind of felt like wind, 
was something larger nudging the rig back and forth. It felt like it was coming from the ground. The only way that I can describe it is like we were caught in a herd of animals, like goats or something. They were gently bumping into the truck, just enough to make it move a little. I said this to my wife, who agreed, then made the deduction that we were technically in cattle country. Ranchers, particularly during monsoon, have a lot of land they can drive their cows through in Arizona. I know it sounds crazy, but it actually made sense to us in our sleepy state of mind. We laid there for a while, pretend like we were going to go back to sleep. I actually kind of did for a bit, but my wife woke me back up again, and this time, I could tell something was really wrong. We were really rocking now, and there was some kind of sound coming from outside, like a whooshing, like wind, but it had this weird metallic echo. Again, this whole night is impossible to describe. At this point, I got out of the bunk and grabbed my flashlight. I didn't want to peel the light blocker off the windows in the back, so I just pushed the divider over and peeked out through the windshield. I couldn't see any animals or moving bushes. I couldn't see anything but darkness. And I found that weird, because I could actually see different shades of black twisting into one another. It was like seeing some kind of special effects in real life or something, I don't know. I turned the flashlight on and shined it through the windows, but I had to get close to see past the reflection. Beyond the glass, there was nothing, just dirt, weeds, sparse cactus here and there. Nothing reminiscent of an animal or swirling dark like I'd seen before. My wife asked from behind me if anything was out there, and I told her no. Not even a cloud of dust, which animals definitely would have kicked up. For all the commotion that we felt, nothing was really happening outside. The second that I clicked that flashlight off, the entire truck and trailer swayed so hard that I could hit the wall of the cab and almost fell to the ground. My wife started screaming immediately. It felt like we'd been tossed out to sea or hit by a train, maybe both. I got back to my feet and grabbed the passenger seat in front of me for support and cover. I wanted to be able to scan the outside area without being seen. If the truck rocked like that again, it could hurt the hitching or mess up the cargo, cause me trouble to put it plainly. I didn't bother with the flashlight now as I could actually see pretty well with just the light of the moon. The desert makes great canvas for things when you're looking for them in the dark. My wife asked me if we should leave. I told her probably. I just wanted to understand what the hell was going on. The truck didn't move again, but outside, we could now hear something. Tapping, planking, vaguely like a stone against metal. My wife actually had the perfect comparison. She said it sounded exactly like one of our little dogs at home, skittered across the tile of the kitchen. The sound of claws clacking against the hard floor. When she said that to me, it creeped me out more than anything for some reason. We sat in silence and just waited, but we didn't have to wait for very long. As I looked through the passenger window, I saw movement out by that tree stand that we spotted earlier. I ducked down, squinted, even considered getting my glasses. I didn't think we'd be able to find them in the dark, so I just stayed put and watched whatever was out there. It only moved between the trees at first, so I figured it had to be an animal. I was hoping for something big, like a bull cow or a horse, something that I could believe maybe pushed on my truck. It took a few steps before breaking away from the tree line. When it did, I was sure I was looking at a person, a man carefully walking amongst the dirt and rocks. He was looking north, away from the truck and the trees. I whispered to my wife that there was someone out there, but she almost had an aneurysm. She kicked off the blankets, found her shoes, and insisted that I get the truck going. And if I didn't, she was going to. To this day, and I don't really know why, I asked her to just to please calm down and wait. We were both there. We were somewhat safe inside the cab, something strange was definitely going on. The logic in me demanded to find out some kind of answer. She wasn't happy with it, but she agreed to wait for just a bit longer. She came up and took a place next to me in the passenger seat. We watched as this guy strode away from the trees, stopped, and then started making really weird motions. 
like interpretive dance or something. He only did it for a second, not even long enough for us to comment on it, then just pointed over to some stones. As he pointed, it looked like he was looking back and forth between the rocks and our truck. Then he was gone. It wasn't like we turned away or blinked and then he vanished. It was like this guy was never out there. What had looked like his pointed silhouette dissipated into a shapeless shadow out beneath the moon. We went back and forth for a while about what we saw and if it was really real. We'd been doing these jobs in summer halls for a couple of years at this point. Nothing like this had ever happened to us. Now that our truck was still and the stranger outside had vanished, exhaustion really started to hit us. We really needed to be resting if we wanted to make good time. So we agreed to catch a few hours and then hit the road before dawn. We could take turns driving all day while the other slept in the back and still stay on schedule. The rest of that night was one of the most peaceful that I've ever had. I slept soundly. I didn't toss or turn. and I didn't wake up until I needed to. There wasn't any sounds or commotion. I felt centered for whatever reason. My wife said the same and we chalked it up to an adrenaline dump after everything we'd been through that night. We got up and ready, brushed our teeth, all our normal stuff. There's nothing like sharing a cabin with someone that has bad breath. That's a true horror story, even compared to the night that we had. Kidding, of course, just a little joke for my wife. I used to call her dragon breath on the mornings that it was particularly stiff. Anyway, I wanted to take a leak while the engine warmed up. I climbed out of the truck and did a little PTI, looked over the terrain for anything that I might get hung up on and wandered off to find a place to pee. I'd almost forgotten how crazy the night had been, up until I saw the tree stand off on the other side of the lot and I made my way over. There wasn't much over there, just some dead high grass, some scratchy bushes, and the tall spindly mesquite. The only sign of a person being back there was a little roadside trash, big gulps and jerky bags, nothing ominous or threatening. I followed that little path that the stranger had walked down until I spotted the rocks that he was pointing at. I picked a tree to water, did my business, and then turned back to head to the truck. I hesitated though. Something in me was screaming to go look at the rocks that we saw that guy pointing at. How could I walk all the way over here and not at least take a look? I turned around and marched over to the stones on the ground. There wasn't really anything over there, shockingly. I kicked around and looked between some of the bigger stones. It was just dirt though. I climbed up onto the highest outcrop, did a final survey of the area, and that's when I saw what looked like a bill of a hat at my feet. And then, a skull, and some other bones, ribs, fingers or toes. Everything was human, no doubt about it. We got on the radio and were able to get hold of local law enforcement. Sheriff's department and DPS were on the scene in no time. As this was a well-known spot, just as my wife assumed. We told them about our story from the night prior. I walked them over to where the bones were. They saw the skull and immediately started taping everything off. It had been there for a while, half buried in the sand and dirt. It wasn't a fresh dump or anything. It got filed as a John Doe for the time being, and my wife and I were cleared to leave after a couple of hours. Police said this area was occasionally known for missing people to turn up both alive and dead. Not just the parking lot, but the entire trail system inside the hills. Vagrants and people having a bad day would sometimes wander off, not realizing just how far they were from the city, and then succumb to the elements and lack of water after that. They didn't immediately suspect foul play, but until they had an ID, anything was possible. We called at the end of the summer for a follow-up, but they still hadn't been identified. It made for one spooky evening an even more surreal morning. My wife likes to think that we saw his ghost that night, who was trying to get a little peace in the afterlife. I think we felt the wind and some shadows, but even then, I guess they still led me to that skeleton. Again, nothing like this has ever happened to us. We didn't live in a haunted house or have some kind of psychic visions or anything. Very little ever occurred to us in the way of supernatural happenings. I'm still not even convinced that it was supernatural at all. The officers told us that it probably hadn't been discovered earlier because of the placement. 
The trees and the rocks on the far side of the lot were more obstacles than anything, so folks didn't ride their toys near them. They unloaded and zipped right into the hills. Either way, it was a crazy experience, and I'm glad it was one and done. I hope that fella didn't suffer out there. When you first become a trucker, you have a lot of delusions about the world, or at least I did. I was a young man when I got behind the wheel, and I didn't know shit from a shoelace. Fortunately, the road is jam-packed with gruff, greasy, degenerate old men that already have made mistakes for us, and boy, are they loud about it. Anytime I stop for coffee or just use the bathroom, some old-timer would have an earful for me. How I could plan a better route drive and manage my time better, improve my wheel handling, all kinds of things. It was always annoying, but sometimes there would be cool little snippets, tips and tricks that actually get you out of trouble. This story is about making a mistake, getting myself into trouble, and using my wits to get out of it. I don't want to give away too much of my personal information, so I won't even say what state this happened in. Let's just say it was north, somewhere parallel with the Canadian border that plays a factor in the story as well. It's later afternoon. I'm skirting my way through a small township, population 11,000. The interstate hooks through this town, just like it does with many small communities, to keep it inside the loop. Towns like these are almost like a truck stop in themselves. You'll find us sleeping in the information center, or the gas station at the edge of town limits, or maybe just the Walmart parking lot. They are handy, but can be annoying too, depending on the time of day. Nothing like hitting a small town and single hour traffic when you just happen to roll through. I just got outside of the town's limits when I saw someone standing on the side of the road. A woman. She's got her thumb hanging out. The sun is starting to dip away. And I can see she's wearing shorts, denim cutoffs by the look of it. It's already 40 degrees outside, but when the sun goes away, it'll plummet to 25 or so, and well below freezing, and this girl doesn't even have a coat on. I could hear a thousand different old timers shouting to me in my head. Do not pick her up. Never pick up a hitchhiker. I remember a buddy of mine picked up a guy and he wouldn't get out of the cab. They're all druggies or crazy. They'll steal your shit and leave you stranded on the side of the highway. No matter how bored, how lonely, how horny you get, never pick up these people. I hit the brakes and rolled onto the shoulder, then watched her saunter up to the passenger door. I realized immediately this might have been a mistake. This girl is much younger than I pegged her for. She looked 20 in the fading sunlight, but now she looks maybe 16. No matter, I'm not a danger or a weirdo. I really didn't have any intentions, but now I'm confused by what this girl is doing out here. I put my guard up as I rolled down the window and braced her. She was as nice as could be. She said her name was Katie and she just needed a lift to the next town. She had some story about coming up here with her friends and getting separated, and now wasn't sure where they were. Katie said the plan was for them to go back to their hometown, which was about an hour away. So she walked to the edge of town and waited. As the day went on, she didn't see them drive by, and she figured maybe she missed them. So she started to hitchhike. I mean, it's almost believable, but some of it still sounded weird to me, made up. I asked her why she didn't use a payphone or try to call home in general. She said her parents didn't know that she took a trip to the next town over. She'd be in deep trouble if she knew that she was so far away. At this point, I just wanted to get back on the road. So I made the mistake of telling her to hop in. Honestly, she was pretty good company for the next 15 minutes. I had all kinds of questions about the truck and the job and what I was hauling in the back. She seemed like an honest, bright, curious high schooler. Had I known who she really was, I would have left her exactly where I found her. Oh, the lessons that I learned. I agreed to drop her off in the next town, whatever. As we're talking, the sun is almost gone and we're caught in the dwindling twilight. This is the worst time to drive, as twilight is the trickster hour. It messes with your eyes. It makes shadows longer, deeper. It's when people see whatever their mind cooks up. Every trucker can tell you about that. Well, I'm coasting along. Katie all of a sudden sits upright and says, What is that? She's pointing somewhere ahead of us. 
I lean forward and start to break, but I don't see anything. Only after we roll another hundred feet or so does something appear, something scattered all across the road. I break and squint over the wheel. It's people, no doubt about it. There are three people laying in a line across two lanes of the interstate. My heart is racing and so is my mind. The hell did I just come upon? I figured there was an accident. Maybe they fell out of bed of the truck and no one noticed. I'm 100% certain that I discovered a fatality and need to call it in. Then I remember that I have a kid in the cab and I don't want her to see what's out there. I look over to her and she had this weird little grin and it disappears the moment that we make eye contact. At this point, I pulled onto the shoulder again as to avoid running these people over any more than they have been. I looked out my side window to inspect the damage, but they all look intact. One of them even seems to be moving a little and looking back up at me. The graybeards start chirping in my head again. People get desperate and do all kinds of crazy shit. They'll stand in the road just to make you stop if they gotta. You see someone in the dark and they're sitting or crawling or doing something weird, you never ever stop. If you do, they're gonna hurt you. Someone standing in the road is so desperate they have nothing to lose. I remembered some of those crazy stories that I heard at diners and truck stops. Little groups of stranded people coming up with ways to stop traffic. And laying in the road was one of those methods. This wasn't just hitchhiking. These people were far more dangerous. Everything clicks in my head, and instead of stopping, I shift and rumble right on into the dark. I could actually see Katie's entire demeanor change immediately. Why aren't you stopping? She asked me. Because there's nothing wrong with them, I said. What? They look like they got run over, she replies. No, they look like they set a trap for me. I'll call them into dispatch and let them know. No, she screamed and almost smacked my hand away from the radio receiver. Now I was sure she knew whoever was back there. This was all part of some kind of weird racket this girl was running. And my good intentions got me caught up in whatever was going on. I was so grateful that she was a 120 pound teenager and not some 200 pound convict. I mean, we can call them when we get to the next town. The police back there are always busy. Now she was offering up some kind of excuse. Things were getting stranger by the minute. We rolled on as that was literally the only option. I was staring at the clock, ticking off every minute until we reached the next town. I was deciding if I would just kick her out or actually take the time to report her and get everything on the radar. My decision was made for me when I saw the police check up ahead, not five miles outside of the town that we were shooting for. The girl turtled up and looked in the back, where my bunk was. She asked if it would be okay if she hid, police make her nervous or something. I said it wasn't going to do any good as I was about to report her anyway, and her friends, or whoever the hell was in the road back there. I stopped where the police directed me to do so, and I rolled down my window. They already vaguely knew who I was and what was going on. The officer asked if I picked up a hitchhiker this evening, to which I said yes. They asked if the hiker was a girl, a young girl. Again, I said yes indeed. She's sitting right next to me. They asked if I knew her, and I said no, and explained I only picked her up because the sun was going down. I originally thought that she was an adult. Upon seeing that she was a kid, I felt compelled to get her out of the cold, and I didn't realize the gravity of the situation. It turns out that Katie's real name was Corey, and she and some of her friends had escaped from a local girl's school. This was real rural living. The girl's school was more like a juvenile detention center than anything. Problem children were sent there, criminal children were sent there, to avoid jail time, as well as for tough foster kids. It's where rural communities could send their wards of the state or kids that families just couldn't handle. The proof was in the pudding. These girls had a pretty serious history of violence. Not just beating up other kids at the detention center, but beating up teachers and counselors. Girls had escaped from this place before, stolen cars, holed themselves up in houses, and just generally created chaos behind them on the run. This was one of the most organized escapes the school had ever seen, and Corey planned the whole damn thing. They stole a set of keys, created this big distraction and one by one, they all slipped out into the dead of the night. Six of them in total, including Corey. There were two more hiding nearby and three laying in the road. 
To my understanding, the plan was for them to get a car to stop. Corey would encourage the driver to pull over, and then all six of them would beat the piss out of whoever was unlucky enough to get caught. Not me, though. Those old timers' advice had finally bailed me out. Also, Corey's lack of a poker face tuned me in that something was definitely going on. She turned on me in an instant, hollering a string of insults, denying everything, and claiming to be a girl named Katie Paolo. The officers opened up the passenger door and started coaxing her out. By the sound of it, they'd already rounded up her buddies and had them in custody. It's not really like they were in huge trouble. They were already in a state program, so this was more about their safety and making sure that they were all accounted for. Also, again, these girls had escaped from the school before. They'd done it all. Vandalism, assault, robbery, arson, you name it. Only after they cuffed her and started putting her into a squad car did Corey's tune change. She started screaming about how she wasn't going back, how they weren't her parents, all that dramatic stuff. She went from pulled together escape criminal to a screaming child in about five seconds. It was sobering to watch. It actually made me feel better about the whole situation. And that was good because I got extensively questioned after this. I probably don't need to tell you how bad it looked for a trucker to be picking up an underage girl and trying to get her out of town. Only after I explained that she was without a coat, pretty much all the logic that I explained earlier, did they give me a little room to breathe. I explained the attempt to force me to stop and steal my truck, and the realization that Corey was running some kind of racket. We all compared notes and came up with the same conclusion. These girls were just planning a crazy escape and I was the first one to stop. Corey confirmed there wasn't anything sexual going on, which was excellent for me. I don't think she realized in the moment that she could have seriously messed up my life with just one little lie. It didn't happen though, and after a thorough questioning, I was allowed to continue onward. You better believe I never picked up another hitchhiker after that encounter, no matter how cold or poorly dressed that they were. That experience put every piece of advice of old timers had given me into perfect perspective. Only takes time for the weird stuff to find you on the road. This all happened years ago. Now, I'm one of those graybeards, and I hassle the youngsters every time I stop for coffee. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around at this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter or X or whatever the hell it's called now. All of that stuff and things and stuff and things are in the description below. Hey, howdy, howdy doody, you long haul truckers, you. Uh, I had, uh, had a good time with this episode. I really enjoyed all three of these stories. I'm sure not everybody's going to like them, but hopefully you enjoyed them just as much as I did telling them. Um, uh, what is it? Thursday missing 411 episode will be out. Um, I know I've unintentionally, me and Zach have kind of put together a lot of uh, camping and outdoor stories, like kind of back to back to back, even though I feel like for some reason also unintentionally, that's kind of been a fan favorite on my uh, channel. Uh, that wasn't my intention when I first started this, but uh, I'm glad there's at least one or two themes that most people tend to enjoy the most. We have a really good lineup of stories, uh, a lot of different themes and stuff like that that I've never even done on this uh, channel, period, is going to be done next month. So I'm really excited to get to, to, get to some of those. Um, so yeah, Missing411. Uh, we'll be out on Thursday and then I have every intention of finally, if you are a, um, if you pay extra, like the $5 a month for the extra tier on this channel, I am fucking awful, dude. I know I suck. I've only put out like two episodes on it since I started that, which is ridiculous. Um, I'm hopefully finally getting into the a rhythm here to the point where I can do that once a month now, sometimes maybe even twice a month. Um, now that I have Zach's help, uh, it, it seems a lot more feasible. So if you're still paying me $5 a month for next to nothing, I promise I'm going to make it up to you. I've said this many times, but I really genuinely mean that I have every intention of getting that fixed and not fixed. Well, I guess fixed and 
and done for the future and for um, all the months to come. So if you're not, no big deal. Don't ever feel obligated to pay me money for uh, the extra tier. More than likely, it'll only be one, maybe two episodes a month. But if you do that as well, even though you're getting next to nothing, I really appreciate every single one of you. And for listening, um, whether you like the episodes or not, whether you like this channel or not, I appreciate you. And um, even even when you comment something negative, uh, all you're doing is helping me. So I appreciate even you. Um, but all outside of that, all of you guys, for the most part, you're all awesome. And I, uh, again, can't say it enough and I won't stop saying that how much I appreciate every single one of you. So I'm going to shut up now. I really need to go get some coffee because I'm struggling today and I will see you on Thursday for Missing 411 episode for the Missing 411 I can't even fucking see that's why I tell you I need some coffee right now I'll see you for Thursday's episode how about that gonna be a really good one so uh I'm looking forward to it and you should too I'll see you then guys cheers <laughs>